It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Thursday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live right here on Giants.com and the Giants mobile app. Joined by Jeff Fiegels, I am John Schmelk. The phone number for you is 201-939-4513. We should be joined by Jacob Hester, who works for uh, SiriusXM on the SEC channel, ESPNU, also host of the Hey Fighting LSU podcast. Hopefully we'll have him in a couple minutes. Uh, But in the meantime, we can chat a little bit here, Jeff, and we are now three weeks to the day. Ooh. From draft night? 21 days. We had a couple of mock drafts at NFL.com over the last couple of days. Let's start with Peter Schrager's that hit today. Did you look at it at all? I'm going to bring it up right well, now. Well, I'm going to read you the top 10 picks and all we right, can kind of chat about it. All right. Jaguars, Aiden Hutchinson. Mm-hmm. Detroit Lions, Kayvon Thibodeau. Oh. Houston Texans, Evan Neal. New York Jets, Sauce Gardner. New York Giants, Iki Aquanu. Carolina right. Panthers, Kenny Pickett. Mm. New York Giants, Trayvon Walker. Oh. Atlanta Falcons, Jermaine Johnson. Number nine, Seattle Seahawks, Charles Cross. Number 10, New York Jets, Jamison Williams. Oh. And then I'll give you the 11th and 12th because I think they're significant. Uh, Washington Commanders, safety Kyle Hamilton. Wow, he drops all the way to there. And number twelve, Minnesota Vikings, Derek Stingley Jr. And he, well, he's got it. Yeah, who which, who, had, who had a pretty which good we'll pro, be talking about a little who, bit. Who had a pretty <clears throat> decent pro day yesterday? I wouldn't say it was fantastic, but it was fine. Well, you know, I mean, mid mid four fours, the jumps were okay. Three cone was solid. You know, it wasn't like you know fall off your chair. You know, faint at the impressiveness of it, but it was it was exactly <clears throat> what you're looking for out of a cornerback. And we'll hear from Jacob more a little bit about him, but I'm just curious. It, 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 he's obviously 100% from that injury. Yeah, he, so, uh, he suffered a uh, Liz Frank injury to his foot earlier yeah, in the year. Yeah, lost some time there, but um, that's interesting because there's a couple of names that you mentioned there, the guys like... Talk to me. Like Hamilton. I mean, uh, it's just more of, you know, everybody talks about how, how he could be the best player in the draft, and for him, in this in this mock draft at least, drop down that far. Um, you know, I, I figure... Hutchinson is a guy you're, they're probably going to have people talk about his arm length, but you know what? Does it really matter? I mean, I, it, come on. I mean, if, if you're that type of an athlete and you've got that much leverage no, and unfortunately, strength. Unfortunately, though, he doesn't win off the edge a lot. Yeah. Like, he doesn't but, bend the edge. So if you don't bend the edge well and you don't have long arms, well, I, think, I think those are legitimate <clears throat> concerns. Sure. Um, and will they, spend, will they send him spiraling down the list? No. But... Uh, so that's interesting. I mean, again, you know, I, I'm the Jets are going to take Sauce Gardner in the, in this one. I mean, that's one of the picks I would like the Giants to be. I think the Jets are interesting, Jeff. Do you think? I think we <laughs> both believe they're going defense with that spot, right? They're not going to pick a wide receiver that early. They're not picking a quarterback. So I think we, at number four, yeah, I think no. we maybe a tackle. I don't want to say that's impossible. Maybe a tackle, but I think with their head coach being a defensive guy, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think, though, where, knowing where he's come from, and you look at how the 49ers are drafted, they've kind of focused on their up front more than their secondary, but they just probably have more of a need in the secondary than up front. Do you think they lean cornerback or pass rusher? I think they lean pass rusher. I think they, they lean pass rusher. I would think they would lead pass rusher, too, based on where Robert Salas come from. You know, they drafted Solomon Thomas. They drafted DeForest Buckner. They drafted Nick Bosa um, mm-hmm. and, and uh, Javon Kinlaw. I mean, look at all those defensive linemen they drafted there. But, I mean, it's Sauce Gardner. If they can get him. <laughs> no, he's a good player. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, they're probably going to have to choose, right? Like, yeah. they're going to have choice of, yeah. of some type of combination of Sauce Gardner, Kayvon Thibodeau, Trayvon Walker. Not a bad list to pick from. No, it's a great list to pick from, but the question is, what are they But it goes back to what you're saying. When you look at the philosophy and what what that coach has seen and done in the past, it makes more sense a defensive rusher. Right. And, yeah. you know, Thibodeau and Walker probably both won't be there, but I think there's a decent shot. One of them is there, plus Sauce is there mm-hmm. for the Jets at four. A little bit of Sauce. <laughs> I think it's interesting. It is. It is. What's interesting is the Carolina... 
Um, Everyone seems to be leaning quarterback for them. Now, I still think, given their coaching situation, and the fact, I think their roster is actually pretty good, especially defensively. I think they have a good, nice defense. You know, DJ Moore's a good player. Christian McCaffrey's sure. a good player. They have, some, they have some nice players. I think they really need an offensive tackle. I think the Jimmy Garoppolo, Baker Mayfield route makes more sense for them than a rookie quarterback. Now, maybe the GM doesn't care about Matt Rule losing his job this year. And that's Matt possible. Rule <laughs> but Matt Rule's not making the decision. Yeah, I know. So, you know, does Scott Fitterer just say to hell with it? I'm drafting the, my quarterback and I'm going to go from there. Mm. I, I think it makes more sense for them to go get one of those veterans, personally. I, I don't like any of the quarterbacks in this draft, so I'm on a, I'm with you. You know, they should have drafted the quarterback last year. That was the mistake. Like they yeah. should have drafted Mac Jones or Justin. Well, they Field thought last they had year. one. They thought it, they, that Darnold could come in there and be their guy and kind of, you know, you know, yeah, do whatever. I know. I guess. I see. In that situation, the price they paid for Darnold was low enough for me, uh-huh. where I'm willing to double up and try to maximize my chance of finding a good one. You know what I mean? Anyway, let's get to our guest. Okay. Uh, let's talk some LSU prospects. Let's do it. We're joined by Jacob Hester. He works for SiriusXM on the SEC and ESPNU channel. Also host of the Hey Fightin' LSU podcast. Jacob, you got John Schmelk and Jeff Fiegels up here in East Weatherford, New Jersey. Hope you're well, man. What's going on? Uh, not too much. Just finishing up uh, hour number three of my eight hours of radio set to go today. But the grind never stops. But when you're a former fullback, like you can't talk about grit and wearing a neck roll if you don't try to grind every day, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and, and the fans should should recognize the name Jacob Hester had a, had a really nice career. So, Jacob, let's talk about this. LSU prospects, we saw Derek Stingley yesterday. The way I kind of phrased it, I think I said this before we had John Hold there. Um, I thought he performed more than well enough. I don't think it was fall out of your chair, like this is ridiculous, but I thought – he hit pretty much right. all the benchmarks you want to see a cornerback hit. And given how well he played as a freshman, uh, I think he did what he needed to do to prove to NFL teams that he was healthy at his pro day. Do you agree? No, I do agree with that. I agree with everything that you just said. I mean, he went out there, his first attempt was a four three seven, then he runs a four four four, which is, a, you know, a good time. You're right. It, it's something he had to do. It's not going to be the fastest time, but it's a really good time. He jumped a 38 and a half about what you – expected he measured over six foot tall which was something that you know that was one of the question marks when he went to the combine when he didn't work out but they wanted to see is he truly a six foot guy is he a 511 guy is he a 510 and a half guy so that was important for him as well but I think these teams just wanted to see you know where are you at as far as your health you had the Liz Frank injury you only played three games a year ago in 2020 you didn't play a full slate either so we're talking about going back to 2019 to really watch your tape to find out who you are now that 2019 tape is as good as a, a, of a tape that there is out there. When you look at who he was going against game in and game out, when you watch these practice clips, when he's going against Jefferson, when he's going against Chase, and he's winning a lot of those battles, those are two of the best receivers in the NFL in this last season and for Jets the last couple of seasons. So it's a very interesting prospect because the 2019 tape absolutely flashes. And when Derek Stingley Jr. is at his best, he might be in the conversation of being the best player in this draft, but you just don't know. You want to know, am I going to get that best? Am I going to get a healthy Derek Singley Jr.? Is he going to be available to me? No, Jacob, absolutely. And again, we're, we're joined by Jacob Hester, uh, former LSU fullback, former NFL fullback, played for the Chargers and the Broncos. Uh, so, Jacob, let's, let's go here. Why do you think that freshman version of Stingley hasn't shown up the last two years? Is it strictly health? Is it something else? Because to your point, I went back and I watched a freshman tape, and if he played that way the last two years, I think he'd be the first overall pick in this draft. I think he was that good. But why, in your mind, do you think we haven't seen that player the last two seasons? Yeah, and it's a very fair question to ask. And I think when you look at the 2020 year, LSU defensively was one of the worst defenses in the country. They were all over the place. There were so many missed assignments. Nobody was on – the same page you saw coverage bust after coverage bust and that to me that that signals obviously like a defensive philosophy more than maybe an individual player and it's not an excuse I mean some really good football players look bad in that defense and we could go down the list of guys that are going to play on Sundays 
that looked like they had never really even taken a college snap before. <laughs> it was just all over the place. Nobody was on the same page. It was one of, again, one of the worst defenses in the country. So you make another coordinator change. So you're talking about playing for three defensive coordinators in three years. That's very difficult to do. <laughs> but this year before he got hurt, there was actually some really nice things to turn on the tape. You can go to the UCLA game. He makes some plays. The Central Michigan game, he makes some plays. So I think it's really just he hasn't been on the field and defensively in 2020 it's hard to grade that tape and I know again it sounds like an excuse but for me when he had a defensive coordinator like a Dave Aranda somebody that is going to be structured somebody's going to make sure that you know your assignment and you go out there and you do it he was one of the best players in the country as an 18 year old going against the best receivers in the country every single day in practice two first rounders in Chase and and certainly in Jefferson and then you got a second rounder in Marshall that's who he's going against every single day. And, look, he always, you know, showed up to work and won a lot of those battles. And so I know it's sometimes nerve-wracking to want to go back that far in a player's career, but I do think this is a unique situation. And you're going to get, if you get a fully healthy Derek Singley Jr., you're going to get one of the best players in this draft. What, um, we talked about his speed. You know, there's game speed, as you know. I'm sure you ran a lot quicker on the game field than you did on the, you know, in the underwear <laughs> Olympics. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. I also want to know of some of the intangibles as far as him and his ability to, you know, go up and get the football. I know he yeah. played a lot of press man covered. That's what he's going to be in the National Football League. Um, talk to me a little bit about some of those intangibles that you see are really, really good. Yeah, I think the game speed's there. I mean, look, if you're a four three seven guy, you can run with almost anybody. Sure. I mean, you're going to have your outliners that are, you know, four two guys and your Tyree kills and all that. But still, you're a four three seven guy. You're going to be able to keep up with any receiver in the NFL. And his game speed is such a smooth runner. I think he's going to be just fine there. But the biggest strength for Derek Stingley Jr. in my opinion is when it's a high point for the ball, when it's a contested catch, he wins those battles nine times out of ten. He plays the ball. So well, when you go back and you watch the tape, I get some really good receivers. When it's a hey one on one jump ball situation, he always won that battle. He's very good with the ball in the air, right? He's not afraid to make a play. He's not one of those guys who is really just trying to to be able to knock the ball down at the point of attack. I mean, he wants to go grab it. He wants to turn over, and he has that ability. So his ball instincts, to me, that's the biggest strength that he has. He's a confident young man. He's played a lot of press, man. But to be able to be a freshman in the SEC and have those battles like mm-hmm. he had, to me, that was one of the biggest things that, that, that stood out to you. And you're talking about receivers that obviously are already playing on Sundays, that are going to continue to play on Sunday. And he always made a play for the ball. And that's just one of those instincts that, as a DB, you look for, but not a lot of guys have it. Even the greats. There's some great cornerbacks that just don't have the ball skills at the elite level, and I think Stingley does. No, Jacob, you're right. Getting your head around on those deep balls, that's a skill. You know, you see so many of these guys commit those defensive pass interferences on those penalties that when they don't get their head around. You're absolutely right. Joined by Jacob Hester. You can hear him on Sirius XMNFL Radio, the SEC channel, ESPNU, host of the Hey Fighting podcast, focusing on LSU football. Last one on Stingley for me, Jacob. I almost hate asking this question because – I hate, you know, fueling these quote-unquote narratives because, you know, I have no personal experience with the kids, so I can't speak to this. But I know you are up close with the program, so maybe you can give some insight. You know, there's been some whispers out there that he's not this, like, alpha personality that you need from a cornerback right. that can, you know, deal with, you know, facing failure, getting beat, coming back on and doing it. He needs somebody to kind of, you know, move him along in that area. Is that a bunch of hooey? Is there something to that? <laughs> What's your insight on kind of – how he's going to handle the mental part of the position as a quarterback, which is, as you know, when you play corner, like yeah. you get beat as many times as you succeed, and you just have to be able to live with that. <laughs> no, it's a very fair question. I think you're exactly right. And I can kind of point to corners that I played with in my NFL career. There were some guys that were great, like Champ Bailey and Quentin Jammer, that weren't like this huge alpha personality as far as doing a lot of talking, doing a lot of yelling or whatever. They kind of kept to themselves, and they went about their work. And Tim Bailey is one of the best that we've ever seen do it. And I've also played with guys like Antonio Cromartie, and, and Crow was uh, one of the most talented corners that we've seen in the last couple of decades. And Crow was going to let you know, like, he was somebody that, that was a talker, right? So everybody kind of does it a little bit differently. I, I don't think it's necessarily about the alpha personality. Like, for my quarterback, I, I probably do want that. I want that guy that's going to be the leader. When he walks into the room, you kind of know that. From a corner, it doesn't have to be that. It just needs to be confident, like you're talking about. You're going to lose some battles. 
Jalen Ramsey is one of the best uh, to do it, right? And he's going to lose some battles, and he'll let you know, right? He's going to lose some battles, but he's going to win a majority of those, and that's what makes him so great. It's being able to one play and cut. If you can one play and cut it, then you have the right mentality. So I think that's just the personality you have to have. Because, look, Derek Singer is not a, a very loud guy. He's kind of a shy guy. He, uh, I don't want to say keeps to himself, but he's not a guy that's going to be out maybe in the front of the group letting you know and talk. DB is a talking position. I think we all know that. Sometimes they <laughs> yep, like to yep, talk yep. a little trash, right? They can get burnt four times, but if they have an incompletion, they're going to do the incomplete sign. They're going to let you know about it. Um, that's not really going to be him, but I do, I do think he has the ability – to be a confident kid. He knows his ability. He's confident in those abilities. And so that's not really the worry. And also I have heard the narrative about, okay, how much does this guy love football? He's missed some time in 2020. In 2021, I think a lot of people thought he just shut it down when he, in fact, did have a Liz Frank injury where that shut him down for the season. And so he's got to go out there and prove that. I think that's why you saw yesterday in the pro day, some of the teams sent the, the heavy brass. They want to know, okay, are you bought in? Are you fully invested in your future because the question was did you play well in 2019 as a freshman and shut it down for two years and i think it's a little unfair because the injury was real the 2020 situ- uh, situation was unique it's a question that's going to be asked he's got to answer that and i think he answered a lot of that yesterday and by the way jacob the reason db is a talking position is because wide receivers generally don't shut up so you have to talk back <laughs> to him at some point right <laughs> go ahead yeah. yeah i mean you look you look at that position and if you don't have some sort of a I mean, both of the receivers and the defensive back, they're all divas, right? I mean, one or the other. So you better be able to talk some smack. and Just like uh, those punters, Fiegel. Oh, yeah, like we guys, talk, yeah, we talk smack to the returners before <laughs> in pregame. Uh, I just didn't kick it to them, so I never had to talk to them. I just kicked it out of bounds. So, um, Jacob, so uh, switching over to the defensive side, Neil Farrell, uh, big boy here, 325. I see him just as a big run stopper. Talk to me a little bit about his uh, consistently playing, you know, that A and B gap. Um, also, I, I'm just reading on some of the things here about his motor skills. I mean, it just seems like he's a guy that's just constantly going and can make some plays and a big run stopper. Yeah, Neil Farrell Jr. probably had the biggest jump as far as from his junior to his senior season. Mm-hmm. He was a guy that was kind of a rotating piece. I mean, he's been here for a while. Like, he played at LSU on that 19 championship team and was a key piece of it. But this year was definitely his best year. He improved on the things that he had to improve on. And when you look at, like, pro football focus, he was, at most of of this year, the highest-graded defensive tackle in the country. He played that well. And he was really a catalyst for this defense to be able to, uh, you know, first five games, I think they led the country in sacks, and he was a big part of that. Because even if he wasn't getting the sacks, he was the guy that was garnering enough attention to be able Mm -hmm. to free up those edge rushers. And so he made huge strides this year and Neil's somebody that you kind of saw it early in his career but you wanted more you needed him to do more so this year he kind of honed in lost some weight and he was a player that you thought he could be in his career so I'm very kind of excited to see where he would go to me he's somebody that within a 4-3 system would probably thrive more than maybe a 3-4 sure. system you just kind just of built for that, that three yeah. technique position yeah, I think, I think that's what, what really would be a strength of his. He can kind of move between those shades. You know, you mentioned one and two shade. He can certainly play a, a three technique as well. So, for me, I think that's the ideal fit for him is to be able to go into that system because, remember, LSU made that change this year. So, when Neil was playing in a 3-4, he was good. But I think in a 4-3, he can be great. So, I, I think that would be the ideal fit for him. Yeah, you know, it's Jacob. It's funny. I, I saw that too. I watched him yesterday to uh, get ready for this interview, and I thought for a guy that played at probably what like three thirty, three forty, right? I thought he moved pretty yeah. well. And I thought when they asked him to be more of a penetrator, and I think we even saw it flashed on on some frankly pass rush moves that had some pretty nice finesse to him. I feel like he's a guy you want as as more of a penetrator than as a guy you just want two gapping. He seems seems to have that kind of explosiveness to him rather than somebody you just want him sitting there and kind of anchoring up. Yeah. Yeah, go watch the Ole Miss film. Go watch the Alabama film. And I think exactly what you're talking about is what you'll see. Yeah, you, you don't want a guy like that two gapping. He's got more skills than that. And mm-hmm. not that two gapping's not a skill. I mean, certainly there's some teams that look for that. But he's a guy that can be in the backfield consistently. I think that's a strength of his. He's quick off the ball. Because, uh, okay, if he goes out there and runs a 40, he, look, he's 330 pounds. I don't really, he's never in a football game going to run 40 no, straight yards. Cares? If he is, Nobody cares. If he is, that's a problem, okay? You don't want your defensive <laughs> tackles doing that. They, they're, they're, you know, they're, not, they're, they're chasing a running back into the end zone at that point. You want to know how quick can he get off the ball. 
And I think that's his biggest strength. He is somebody that is incredibly fast off the ball. Again, I encourage you to go watch the tape. The Ole Miss game was kind of the starter when they changed some defensive things up in the rest of the season. Go watch the Alabama tape against the who's who, right, the Alabama offensive line. Go watch that tape. He was in the backfield all game long. I think his first step is his best step, mm-hmm. and that's the biggest strength for Nell Carroll Jr. All right, we got a couple more defensive guys here, Jacob, and uh, then we'll hit uh, Ed Ingram on the offensive line here. Uh, I know, unfortunately, now maybe he won't get drafted. Uh, I watched his tape yesterday anyway, linebacker Damone Clark, uh, who had a nice bounce back year, I thought. You know, a guy that, you know, flashes a lot of athleticism. But then, of course, he had to have that spinal fusion surgery because of the herniated disc. Who knows what's going to happen now? Just give us some insight into Clark and if a team decides to kind of roll the dice on in round six or seven, what they could be getting if he manages to get healthy and get back on the field. Yeah, just absolutely awful the news he got out of the combine. Damone Clark, uh, look, I wore number 18 at LSU, and that's a jersey number that is passed down. You don't get to choose number 18. Yeah, it's a big deal here in Baton Rouge. And he got to wear that jersey number over the last two years, and he's a guy that absolutely deserved it. Did everything the right way. In 2020, the tape wasn't good, kind of like Derek Stingley. Defensive philosophy was just kind of bad all over the place. Nobody really knew what was going on. And you saw these guys make plays in 2019, so that points to me. And they weren't coached the proper technique or nobody really had the game plan ready to go. So that's on the coaching, not the young man, because he came back in this year. He was one of the leading tacklers in the country. He was an all-SEC type guy. You mentioned his athletic ability. I mean, he's a 4'5 guy every single day, and that's at 6'2", 240 pounds. Right, he's a long 33, I think, was was, uh, the arm measurement that they had him at the combine. So... This is somebody that I think you go back and you watch 2019, you watch 2021. He's lined up all over the place. He's certainly been a Mike Stack backer. He's been on the line of scrimmage in 2019, jersey number 35, if you're watching that tape. And he's making plays. He can be very versatile. The injury's crushing. I don't know you know, what teams are, are going to look at when they look at that injury. It's obviously a very serious injury, but I think he's too talented not to go drafted. Somebody can take a flyer on a Damone Clark, like you mentioned, sixth, seventh round maybe put him away for a year to kind of see how that ends up because this is somebody that can truly be sideline to sideline. He can rush the passer. He can literally do a lot of things in coverage. If you go back and we were at uh, the senior ball practices in Mobile, I thought he had one of the best weeks covering the backs, covering the tight end. So very unfortunate injury, but I still think if he's cleared, he's got a bright NFL future. Uh, Jacob, uh, talk a little bit about Cordell Flott. Uh, I think I pronounced his name right. I'm hoping, um, yeah. you know, big dude, six foot one for a cornerback. Um, did he, you know, where did he spend a lot of his time inside, outside? A little strength and weaknesses about Cordell. Uh, yeah, Cordell Flott is definitely going to be a, a nickel corner. That's kind of where he lived in his LSU career. Big day for him yesterday, being able to show he could run a four four. I think he was a four four flat. In his first attempt, that's obviously big for him. Also something that was big, again, measured over six foot. A lot of people thought maybe he'd be 5'11", five, 5'10", five, and a half. So he got the measurements there. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, Cordell is somebody that and early in his career, there were times when he struggled. And I think he'd be the first to tell you that. He relied on that speed maybe a little too much. Thought maybe his speed could catch up to some of the, the receivers in the SEC, giving them kind of that cushion and being able to rely on your speed when you come out of high school is just kind of what they do. So he's definitely somebody that had to learn technique and had to learn how to play nickel corner. Nickel corner is so much more important than it used to be. Oh, sure. I mean, used to, it was like your third, your third, fourth guy, and you just kind of threw him in there. It's really uh, a position where you have to have a specialist now. It's no longer like your third best corner. Jalen Ramsey's hey, in there full time now, right? Person. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, look at uh, look at the New Orleans Saints and, and C.D. Deuce. I mean, C.D. Deuce is, is yep. somebody that like he thrives in that nickel position. At safety, I don't think he's as valuable to the team. But because he's so good in the slot, I mean, he means so much to that defense. It is such a position of need in today's NFL with the way the offenses are going. So teams are probably going to like that he spent his entire career really inside at LSU. He never really went outside. I don't think he, I don't think that's a strength for him. I think being inside is a strength for Plot. UCLA games, one of the games that he popped, they had a couple of really good tight ends for UCLA. I thought he did a nice job in that game. Um so, look, he continued to get better. I think him living in the slot was big. I think the 40 time yesterday, the measurements were big for him. Uh, he's physical for his size. He's not a big, he's not a heavy guy. Obviously, it's not something where you would be like, he's 175 pounds, probably soaking wet. But he is physical for that size. He'll come up and tackle, which is not all about coverage in the slot. 
It's about can you come up and stop the run as well because, yes, it's spread offenses, but still, as we know, they'll run that inside-outside zone out of spread, out of gun all day long, and you have to be able to come and make a play. No, no question about it. Very important. You have to be able to be physical out there for sure. All right, let's go over to the offensive side of the ball. Ed Ingram, the big guard. Not someone that you're going to sign up to, you know, watch him run a 40 or do, do all this athletic testing. Big guy, 6'3", 307. Um, 33 and 5 eighths arms, which is really good for a guard, Jacob. Uh, started one year at right guard, three at left guard. You know, I thought when he, and this is kind of the one thing that I, that I wrote down that kind of jumped to me watching him. Once he gets his hands on you, you're not getting off of him. He's very strong and powerful. And I thought, especially as a puller in the run game, that's where he kind of, I thought, you know, played his best football. Mm-hmm. Without question, he was, he was really good in the gap scheme. The gap scheme is a strength for Ed Ingram. Um, when you look at power and counter, of course, we're talking power A gap scheme, counter a B gap scheme. You go watch the Florida game, and, I mean, they ran counter. I'm not trying to be funny here, guys. They must have run counter 18, 19 times in the Florida game alone. They set the single-game rushing record for LSU football in that game, and a big part of that was Ed Ingram. That is definitely his strength. It's something that I think even if he slots to the center position at the next level, we know there's some centers in the NFL that can pull. He'd have that ability. He needs to probably get better in the zone run schemes, that is not a strength of his. They're going to ask you to be better in that because of, again, so much inside-outside zone. You've got to be better, more consistent there. And he's played a lot of football. He's played in a lot of different systems at LSU. I mean, this is a guy that, I mean, you can go way back, and he played, you know, uh, 2018 against Georgia when Georgia was number two team in the country coming into Baton Rouge. I mean, he was a starter on that team. So a lot of starting football in the SEC at LSU so gap scheme, if you're a gap scheme run team, then he is your guy. If you're a zone scheme, he still needs to be consistent in the zone scheme. But if you play that much football in the SEC, you're a starter that long, obviously he's going to have a place in the NFL. And if you have the right system, Ed can play both guard positions. I truly think we saw him in Mobile play some center. He can be a very versatile guy. And you mentioned the length. That's what you don't get from guards. Most time guards, hey, look, I'm a stubby fullback, so I can appreciate this. they got the little stubby <laughs> arms. And it's always like you're going against Aaron Donald. You can't get your hands on him. It's a little bit of cause for concern there. That's not going to be the situation for Ed Ingram. So in the right uh, philosophy, the right system, I think he can be a starter in the NFL, not just a uh, kind of a swing guard center guy. Yeah, I thought the one thing I saw when he got into trouble a little bit, Jacob, I'd like to get your take on this, is that in pass pro, I thought a lot of times when guys tried to use their quickness on him, he would bend at the waist a yeah. lot, and he would kind of lose his balance, and he, he would kind of lunge a little bit at those guys, and he would you know get that forward lean going, and as you well know, as someone that made their career blocking, that's yeah. when you can kind of get yourself into trouble. Oh, without question, man. If you're if you don't use your technique in that, and if you have bad habits, you you got to break them, or you're not going to last long. Certainly, if you're a guy that reaches and you bend, I mean, those guys are so talented. They're going to swipe your arms. They're going to be upfield, and you're not going to be no matter how athletic you are, good enough to be able to recover. That's something you you got to you know you got to teach yourself. You have to force yourself to stay back, and it doesn't matter the matchup you have. I always. Like, there's always those matchups, right, when you're going against maybe the stud defensive tackle. I know for me it was stud outside linebacker. You worried so much about getting on that player quick because you didn't mm-hmm. want him to have his bag of tricks. You didn't want him to have his bag of moves. Well, the problem with doing that is, well, then you fall out of your technique. Then you're playing into his game because you have so much momentum going forward, it, even if it is from the backfield or at the line of scrimmage, then you don't use your technique. You start to lean forward because you're lunging, trying to get your hands on him quicker. And you're right, Ed did fall into that when he was going to get some of the premier defensive tackles. And you can't do that. You can't create those bad habits. Uh, look, it, it was baptism by fire for me. I, I know when I first got into the NFL, like the first game up, I had to go block Julius Peppers one on one. I'm like, first off, good luck. Why in the world? <laughs> he thought this was a good matchup. Like, who thought that the uh, the fullback on Julius Peppers and pass pro was a good matchup? But whatever. And I remember trying to get to the line of scrimmage so quick because he was so athletic. And basically, like, I ran past him. I was trying to get there so quick, right? So you have to use your technique. Trust your technique. There's a reason you're there, and don't try to switch it up for certain players. Or you're going to get in trouble. Awesome. Uh, Jacob, this has been fantastic. We really appreciate it. Anyone else? I know there's a couple of the guys that are coming out. Austin Deculus, Tyrion Davis-Price, Chase and Hines. One of those three or maybe anyone else that you really would like to you know, put a spotlight on that you think yeah. maybe is a little unappreciated coming out of LSU. All right, I'll, I'll give you a couple of names. Andre Anthony is one of them. He's a defensive end that tore his ACL in game number three for LSU against Central Michigan. He is somebody that 
ran a 4.63 yesterday, six months after ACL surgery at 245 pounds. He is somebody to watch. He's played in a 3-4 and a 4-3, so watch out for Andre Anthony. You mentioned Ty Davis Price. Ty Davis Price ran a 4.48. He's a 225-pound running back, 230 pounds. He can carry that type of weight. He has the most rushing yards in a single game in LSU history, and we know the names that have played at LSU at that position. That's saying something. And he did it against the Florida Gators. Watch out for him. Continue to go down the list. John Trey Kirkland, a guy that's literally played every position at LSU, including quarterback Mm -hmm. in the bowl game, jumped 42 inches yesterday, broad jumped over 11. He can play anywhere. He's going to be a team's guy, probably play for like six, seven, eight years, just being a versatile guy. So you'll hear his name. And the last guy – I gotta show some love for the kicker, Cade mm-hmm. York. Cade mm-hmm. York has yeah. got a bionic leg. He is somebody that like fifty plus yards was almost automatic, which at the collegiate level is almost unheard of. He'll be a drafted kicker. He won so many games for LSU, including that one a lot of LSU fans remember, twenty twenty in the fog in Gainesville. He kicked a fifty four yarder to win the game. You couldn't even see the upright, but he still nailed it right down the middle. <laughs> Cade York gonna play like a decade plus in the NFL. So that's a couple of under-the-radar names that sure. uh, LSU fans know, but I think the NFL world will know them by the end of the year. Awesome. Jacob, fantastic, yeah, man. Thank if, you, Jacob. If, if, if the Giants draft someone from LSU, I'll be in touch. We'll chat again. Otherwise, we look forward to talking to you next year when we go through this draft process again, my friend. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Sounds good. Anytime, guys. All right, Jacob. Have a good one. Thank that's you. Jacob Hester. Again, you can hear him on ESPNU and, of course, on the <clears throat> SEC channel on Sirius XM. Also host of the Hey Fighting podcast, focusing <laughs> on LSU football. Former NFL fullback, former LSU yeah. fullback as well. I didn't realize he wore number 18 at LSU. That is a big deal. It's a big deal to have him wear 18, period. That's just a great number. <laughs> and 10 and 17. But, you know, you finish up with 18. I'm a little. Uh, what I like about having guys like Jacob, I because number one, he's a he played football at the collegiate pro level, but just getting the insight on some of these things, and this is what's great about what we do here, at Big Blue Kickoff Live, is with these interviews, is that you get really good information from some of these guys, and, and you can tell that he's still in with that program, hundred percent. Which I yeah. feel like you know, you you we always got we always hear of all these draft experts and things like that, but these are guys that are covering the whole league, if you will. These are guys that are they're rooted in with. LSU football. Well, right and now. he also yeah. understands the difference between LSU football and then okay, now we're going to go play NFL football. Yeah. So we could talk sure. about that aspect. One hundred percent. Yeah, and I mean, and he gets it because he knows the transition and stuff like that. And um, you know, when you look at Neil Farrell uh, Jr., I like him, Jeff. Well, I think he's like a good. Did you see the Alabama game? Pick. The Alabama game last year that he was all over yeah, the place. He was. Mm-hmm. he was in that game. Um, you know, we try to watch as much film as we can. We can't watch everything. I know John watches tons and tons more than I do. Well, I, see, here's the thing, and, and I, I make your point, and then I, well, I and, I, and, then, and then I'm actually going to ask you a question. Well, my point is, is that we don't watch film on everyone. At least I don't. But the ones that I, you know, the ones that I do, I follow Pro Football Focus pretty closely. I feel like they have really good grades and things like this. So I look at those, and then I'll go and look at some of the tape. Some of these guys, they stand out in art, in like the way that I like to watch film way more than some of the, the you know some of the stuff that they write about it's like you just kind of see some intangibles in there mm-hmm. when you watch enough football and been around it enough and so i that's why i enjoy when i see a guy like jacob come on here and then reinforce kind of what your eyes see yeah you could tell he he really liked farrell big time mm-hmm. really big time what were you gonna say First of all, we'll open up the phones. 201-939-4513. Next half hour. I know we started a few minutes late, so we'll go to around 105 today. We'll take your calls, and we'll talk Giants football. So get on the line, and let's chat. I'm debating whether or not... Look, as you know, Jeff, unlike you know the Dane Bruglers of the world and all these other guys that do this for a living, they're watching tape all year long, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to you know jam six months' worth of tape viewing into two and a half. <laughs> you know, and it's hard. And, yeah. you know, I'm blessed here being with the Giants where I have access where I can, you know. All the teams, I, all the games. I can watch anything I want, and I can sort it, right? So I can say, all right, I want to see every time this guy ran for 10 or more yards if you're a running back, boom. Yeah. Every time a wide receiver's targeted 10 or more plays down, 10 or yards or more down the field, boom. I can just watch those that's plays. Incredible. I'm very lucky. But I wonder, and that's what I do, so I can get through stuff as quickly as yeah. possible, yeah, right? Yeah, you have to. Because I want to try to, I, I like to try to get, like, I want to have a really good feel for everybody in the first four rounds of the draft. I want to yeah. get to like 150-ish guys if right. I can. I usually only get to like 110 or 115. Yeah. 
A hundred's even good. You know, hundred's good. Yeah, but I'm 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 trying to do as 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 good as I can, right? And I wonder if I miss out not watching as many full games as I should. Because I don't sit there and watch, all right, I'm oh, going to watch this guy for a full no, game. No, there's no question. You'd miss because, out. But you can't. But it's, it's, uh, that's what I'm saying. I feel like I'm giving an incomplete picture. Maybe maybe for certain guys, maybe for like the top 50, I need to watch a, a couple full games. It's, what I, it's basically what I like to do. I, all right, let me see the plays where this guy did really well. Right, right. All right, so what does he do well? And, you know, okay. I see, okay, this is what I know he's good at. Right. Then, all right, let's look at his bad plays. All right, what does he do poorly? When can he when, when for a receiver? When does he not get open? Mm -hmm. Does he have drops for an offensive lineman? When how does he get beat? Right. So I feel like you could, if you look at all an offensive lineman, the guy's bad penalized plays, a lot. What, what is he doing? Why is he getting right, penalties? Why right? Why is why are the bad plays there? Yeah. Is that fixable? You know, is it all right? Well, if he you know gets better hand placement, it'll be okay. You can maybe fix that. Sure. Okay. Well, that's he's, a technique thing. Well, okay. No, he's just not athletic enough to to get on the edge against fast guys. Well, then that's a big red mark. You should on be his able record. to find that out. Yeah. Right. But you know, I I feel like, and this is with you know Thibodeau, I think is a perfect example, right? Like when I finished my process in the top twenty guys, you're he, like, wow, he was my number one guy in the class. Of course. But since I didn't watch three or four full games, well, I didn't see the plays that he took off. Yeah, I was gonna say, you, you know, know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. I, it, and, that, it, and by the way, there's there's a knock there's a knock on him. I have been struggling with how the best method for me to do this, where I can still get as many guys done as I want to, but I see everything I have to. It's a really tough balance. It is, and I think where you can make up the difference because you know you can read a lot quicker sometimes in watching film and going through. So I think you you watch what you can, and then it's and then you it reinforces what you're looking at. By reading some of what the people are saying, the people that do have the time exactly. to watch five so or six, they're doing games, the work right? for yeah. you by by summarizing a little bit of it. No. I understand that, but it, it's yeah, very yeah. difficult. Unless, unless John, you were just to say to yourself, you know, and this is kind of a, a lot, a lot more like what I do. The top one hundred is kind of where I I hang out in. So, you know, that's still a lot of people. Oh no, it's, it's a lot. Trust <laughs> me. Well, you know, the, you know. You know I'm, I'm a big Knicks fan. I'm not doing my Knicks podcast anymore or anything because I have a second kid coming and my wife would murder me. But, <laughs> you know, I always joke with the guys that do the NBA draft stuff and they're like, oh, man, we got to watch all these players. I go, hey, you guys have two rounds. There's oh, yeah, 60 how about guys it? Yeah. and only yeah, like 30 of them are good. Right. And, guys, and by the way, there's only five positions. There's only five guys on the field at once. <laughs> yeah. Like, give me a break. Yeah. That's easy. Oh, I, can, yeah. I, I can be doing my NBA draft prep in like three days. Oh my God. Yeah. Like this is, it's, it's a yeah. whole different ball game. Yeah. Man. I mean, each one, each <laughs> one of these positions, you've got like top 10 ranked players at each position, 11 players that's 110, 11, 100, whatever, do the math right there. That's a lot. Oh, so hard. yeah, very difficult. And you know, and some, and you know, look, I can go through wide receivers pretty quick, right? If I watch like 40 or 50 targets for a wide receiver, I get a pretty good feel for them. Quarterbacks too. I can go through corners pretty quickly. Let me ask you a question. So the this guys that are hardest though, linebackers, mm -hmm. because you have to watch coverage. Yep. You have to watch run game. Yep. You got to watch Blitz. this safety. Same mm, deal, right? Well, how do you cover man to man? Well, mm -hmm. how do you cover in zone? How do you support against the run? How do you blitz yeah. linebacker? How do you blitz? Lots of stuff. Those are the guy and tight end. Same deal. Well, how do you pass catch? Well, how do you run block? How do you pass block? Mm -hmm. So it's like there's a lot more facets for those spots for me. Right. Like it'll take me. I can get through a wide receiver and feel pretty good about it in 15, 20 minutes. Right, right. I need an hour for a linebacker yeah, or a I mean, tight end. Because like, you it have takes to go through time. And, 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 you know, with the X's and O's system, you can punch in a lot of the stuff that it helps you with Yeah, that. but blocking still hard to find. Like, blocking, you have to watch um, a lot of plays to get blocking down, how well a guy blocks. It's harder. It's very difficult. Um, and then, of course, I'm a big believer, and I, I think, you know, watching film with the guys the way they play, I think is... is I mean, I put a, lore, a lot more credence in the way the guys play than any of this testing stuff. It just oh, reassures yeah. how these guys laterally can move side to side. Explosiveness, Explosiveness is big for thing. me, yeah. Exactly. And, and also, the other thing, too, is that with penalties, penalties tell you stories now. Penalties are, you know, guys, there's reasons why guys commit penalties, folks. It's technique-based. It's fundamental-based. It's knowledge based. And sometimes it's lazy based, and too. it's lazy based. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that when you look at that, and the first thing you want to look at, okay, so how many penalties does this have this guy have on this season? Zero. Oh my god. Okay, so like, tells me, like for example, Zion Johnson's one of those guys. Yeah, unbelievable. When you okay, think about that. So he's what he's so, how many snaps? So technically sound. Anyway, yeah. Make so your point. I'm my sorry. point is is that you know you can look at those things, and by the time when you're scouting and we're looking and we're we're analyzing these players, there's a little bit of a 
tail of the tape that gets you to the point where you can really make your decision on how good of a player this is. Because you want the guys coming to this next level. Penalties cost you games, as Coach Coffin always used to say, right? Yeah, because if you're getting overwhelmed in college and committing penalties, what's going to happen when things you, are going three you're times not gonna fast it. here? You're not going to make it. Unless, let's just say uh, Thibodeau is a guy where you know he's offsides a lot. Well, I mean, right. okay, we're going to teach you to watch the ball a little bit because we're not. We know that your 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 skills are advanced. Right. <laughs> we'll deal with the offsides. See, that's my worry. I got two guys that I'm worried about with that specifically: Trevor Penning, commit a lot of penalties, mm-hmm. and again, that's at a lower level of college football too. Yeah, and when he gets to this level, and guys are getting off the ball quick. Yes, and you know, Len called a couple weeks ago and made the point. Well, oh, I don't want to settle for Trevor Penning. I want one of the top three guys, and I kind of fought back to him a little bit. But I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? Penning's a step down, like from the cross at Quanus and Niels. He's 100%. a legitimate like half a round value down, and and given and this it does make program, a distance where they play. Yes. Now, I did feel he wasn't flawless at the Senior Bowl. Right, he was good. He wasn't flawless. Which he had to be. Right. And what makes me feel better about him is that he tested so well. So you know he has the athleticism to hang with NFL guys, but can he figure – and the other guy, by the way, is Tyler Smith at mm-hmm. Tulsa. He, to me, is another level or two down mm-hmm. from Penning. A lot mm-hmm. of people are putting him in the end of the first round. Unless you're putting him in a guard, Jeff, to me that's kooky talk. I think they are going to put him in a guard. Well, that's fine because if you put him at tackle, dude, no. like – you go watch his game. If you have two seconds, go watch his game against Cincinnati. Well, it looks like he's never played offensive tackle before. His hands and arms are all, he's like flailing around like a like like right. it was like Paul Dettino like running on the practice field. <laughs> his arms flailing everywhere. Well, first of all, if you if you are a tackle and you're going to be taken in the top ten, you're most likely not coming from a small school. Yeah, we really. I mean, I guess right the Eric Fisher year. It was Fisher, and who was the other guy that got drafted next to Fisher that year in 2013? I don't remember. I'll check it out. Go ahead. I'm sorry. But my point is that you know most of these guys that are going to be filling your top 10 picks, well, you know, just a big time lineman, they come from big time programs because Luke Joko was the other guy, Luke Central Joko. Michigan. Okay. Well, but you know, Joko was from Texas A&M, so I actually take that back. It was Fisher from Central Michigan. That was a smaller school. So I mean, because I think the the jury is out on those guys because of this competition. You know, they're not going up against the elite pass rushers in the SEC and the ACC and things like that. So, um, Well, at, but, the, at those know, premium positions, you're going to have premium athletes from premium schools. A hundred percent. And so if you have a good tail of the tape between with those guys, I mean, it gives you a better chance. Uh, the testing is just an extension of what people are seeing on the field. It just better proves that what they are, their eyes are seeing is true. Yeah. And it, sometimes it's even better. And I think and that's why I don't think testing for the big school guys is all that important. Because to your point, all it does is confirm what you see. Right. But for like corners and wide receivers and tackles and defensive ends from smaller schools – where you see them dominate on tape, okay, well, great. They dominate against guys that they're never going to see at the next level. So mm-hmm. who cares? Like, I go back to three years ago when I watched uh, O'Shane Zimenez, right, coming out of Old Dominion. So clearly not a Power 5 school, plays a bunch of, you know, players that are, you know, future accountants. They're not future <laughs> NFL players, yeah. right? And I remember watching one of the first games I watched, played Citadel. Oh, Okay. He's going against probably some like 5'11, 270 pound tackle. Yeah. It's about all they are. It's the Citadel. That's and, as high as they can get up there. And O'Shane <laughs> Zimenez, it, it, it looks like a college kid playing against like a Pop freshman yeah. in high school. Yeah. And he's just clowning this guy. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to kill the guy. It's not his fault. It's, it's a different class of athlete, athlete yeah. right? And. Then I'm like, oh, my God, this guy's unbelievable. Look how great this guy is. And then I forwarded, look, let me look at some more tape. I was all pumped. Get to the com- I got to the senior board. I'm like, this guy is going to show up, and he's going to be fantastic. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, he starts lining up against these power five offensive tackles. Doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Can't and you're happen. like, no. huh, see? that's And then he goes and tests, and he tests. Shazimin has tested fine. It right. was like yeah. average stuff. But you're like, all right, that's where that stuff comes. That's where the post draft process is helpful. Hundred percent, and 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 uh, medical, of course, of course, <clears throat> interviews and all that stuff too. And then then you have your guys that, you know, you kind of like coming out of college, fourth rounders, fifth rounders that you know not a high grade on them, and then they surprise you. Yeah. And next well, thing that, you know, well, you know, a guy like Ellerson Smith, who you're rolling the dice on, right? Small school, but he tested yeah. ridiculously well. Sure. Roll the dice. Yeah. It's a roll of dice. 
And all this is a roll of the dice. Go back and look at... Uh, dude, first-round uh, picks are in some ways a roll of the dice, let alone fifth-round picks. My well, gosh. Just go, go back and do yourself a favor and go do a little research on the top, you know, the first-round quarterbacks in the last <laughs> however many years and see how many of those guys... It's like one out of three or one out of four. It's, it's, it's horrible. It really is. And, the, and, you know, and they put so much credence in that pick. That's why this year I, I just... I, I know it's going to happen, gonna but I, I just don't see anything... Well, we, we were doing our draft season podcast. And by the way, folks, if, if you want to go check it out, it's not on the Giants Huddle feed anymore. So go subscribe to draft season. It's its own separate podcast feed. And Jason and Charlie, we'll make sure we get you guys and we'll give you plenty of time before we wrap here. But I think we're having an interesting conversation. Um, with the quarterbacks, I made the point on the draft season podcast. We had a podcast where we basically picked out our favorite day two prospects at each position. And oh. we did quarterback. Mm -hmm. And it got to me. And my answer was, I don't have one. Because... I'm not going to pick a quarterback on day two. I think it's a waste of time. Mm. And they're like, well, John, why? I go, because the quarterback that should be getting picked on day two, they're getting picked on day one. <laughs> yeah, there won't be any left. No, it's true. <laughs> like, guys, that, like I think Malik well, Wills. That, it's, this year. And, you know, I've been very positive about Malik Wills and his skill set. I think he is the chance, if he figures things out in a couple years, to be a really good NFL quarterback. Yeah. But what's the chance he hits that peak? 20%? 30%? I think there's a less of a chance that he does than there is a chance that he... There's less of a chance that he doesn't than there is a chance that he does. 100% agree with you. It's a hard position to Which play, Which is why man. I wouldn't pick him in the first round. Right. Or the second round. He's going to be a top 20 pick. Of course. Like Kenny Pickett. I think Kenny Pickett's a relatively safe player. I think he's going to be a competent NFL quarterback. Mm -hmm. Why would I use my pick at 35? And now the Giants are going to do this and make me look stupid. But why would you go? And I don't think they will, by the way. I'm just making no, a joke. No, they're not. But why would you go pick a quarterback that's just going to be fine and be good enough to get you to 8-9 and nine or 9-8 nine and eight when I can go pick a high-end starter in another position? I, it's so important now, Jeff, to have a really good quarterback. It, well, it, Why am I using a pick on a guy that's just going to be fine? This isn't a day and age where, you know, Derek Carr was drafted in the second round. Yeah. If Derek Carr was coming out of this year's draft, he'd be a top five pick. No question. It doesn't work that way anymore. It's just such a hard thing to do. And you know, if you're gonna if you are gonna draft a quarterback that high, you got to be really sure that he's gonna be a, a player. Right. Yeah. Look, and I know some teams are more comfortable in getting off of these guys quicker now. We saw that with Josh Rosen. Mm -hmm. But I think, generally speaking, people have hard times quitting on top ten picks after a year. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because somebody's losing their jobs. Uh, unless you can replace them right away with somebody really good, like the like like the Cardinals did with Kyler Murray, yeah, with, with Josh Rosen, yeah, uh, oh. yeah. That that usually if you pick a bad quarterback and you're a GM, it usually means you're you're finished. You're done. Yeah, because you not not only did you your quarterback didn't work out, your team stunk. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you get fired, and the next GM gets that number one pick really high because that's what happened. Yeah. And right. that's really kind of what it happens. <laughs> it's just, I, I don't know. Um, I just don't see anything that I like in the quarterbacks this year to go up and, you know, even though some, it's going to happen. Somebody will. It's going to happen. Somebody it's will. It's just the way it goes. All right, let's get to the phones now. Jason and New. Oh, I should read a piece of copy here first, Pearson. I didn't read any of these yet. Giant season tickets are on sale now for 2022. In addition to ticket savings, membership benefits also include access to exclusive events like meeting Jeff Fiegels, experiences, yes. pre-sales, and more. You can lock in your seats starting at just 100 bucks. Call 888-NYG-1925 or visit Giants.com slash tickets for more information. Now we'll go to Jason and New Haven. He'll lead us off. Jason, thanks for holding, man. I apologize yeah, for taking hi, the time to get to you. What's going on? No, I appreciate you guys taking my call. So it's all good. Thank you, fellas. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'll try to make it quick. I just have a few points. This the um the meetings that the the, new, the players are having with the coach. I think they're having like a what what is what is going on this week? Is uh, like a, yeah, these are these are now what's going to happen between now and the draft, Jason. And all the teams do this around the league. They're called your thirty visits. Each team is allowed thirty in person visits to their facility. Right from players, which basically you can spend the whole day with them or as many hours as you want. You can do a workout with them if you want. Somebody you can watch today. tape with them. Big dude. Well, no, I mean, uh, today was a Giants local workout day where oh. everyone from the local area, you can have like dozens oh, wow. and dozens of guys. So like the Rutgers guys. Okay. Now for a team like the Cowboys, 
local workout day is huge because yeah. you get Texas, Texas get, A&M, Baylor. Yeah. You get yeah. all these guys. Up here, you got like right. you got Rutgers. Monmouth. Yeah. <laughs> Sacred <laughs> yeah. Heart. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Wagner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, yeah, Jason, that's oh. what's happening. And I know there have been some reports out there, I think. Uh, Mike Garofolo had a report, and so did Albert Beer, that some of the guys the Giants have brought in, uh, Trayvon Walker, Brian Robinson from Alabama, the running back, Brees Hall and James Cook, the running backs, okay. and then Nick Benito apparently at some point will yeah. be making a visit. And so we're not confirming those, by the way. We're just saying that those have been reported out there. Right. Um, I was only bringing that up because I know a lot of the a lot of the um, current players return for workouts and stuff like that. Yeah, they're here. Uh, I, yep, I, I was reading some you know stuff online and just stuff on um, just over the radio about the whole Tony not being there. And I don't necessarily think it's a big deal. I mean, you guys can respond after or after I get off the phone, but um, I don't necessarily think it's a big deal. It's not like they're doing any plays or running routes or getting the playbook at this moment. It doesn't seem like that. It seems like they're just literally working out. Um, so I wouldn't get too crazy. I'm not saying that you guys are, but I wouldn't get too crazy. On, uh, I know a lot of fans are kind of antsy why he's not there, but it isn't, it's voluntary at this point. So I wouldn't get too crazy over that. That was my first point. Um, the second point with the draft, um, I'm hearing all this hype for Trayvon Walker and Aquanu, and I'm really hoping um, one of those players or maybe one of the quarterbacks gets picked in the top four um, because I'm really hoping Neil or Thibodeau falls to us. Yeah, I, I want like Neil. Be... I want Neil badly, Jason. I'm not going to lie. That's right. That, that's the guy I've kind of settled on that I, I really want to fall. Yes, because while Aquanu is a big, imposing player, I you know, I played O-line in college, and um, to me, he seems like he'll be an all-pro guard. And I don't know if you – so if you put him and, and Nelson on the same plane, um, most people would take – coming out of the draft, of course, most people would take Nelson. And even a lot of people thought he got taken too high. So to me, Aquanu at five or seven, um, playing tackle where he lunges a lot, um, I know I, I see a lot of the hype, and he is a good player, but – I don't necessarily know if I love him at tackle. And if you're picking him that high and he's not playing tackle and you put him at guard, that to me is like kind of a, I don't want to say a waste of, of um, a draft slot, but to me it would be. No, I hear you. That was just my, that was just my idea. And I'm really hoping Neil and Thibodeau falls. Who knows what will happen in draft. Crazy things happen. Last point, and just kind of like a fun uh, question for you too, since you guys have been with the Giants for a long time. Where do you guys rank? I always, I never hear people talk about this player, and I thought he was a not great player, but he was a really, really good player when he came to us, um, which is Kerry Collins. Um, he had that magical run in, I think that was 2000, when we played the Ravens. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, what, where do you guys kind of – now, I'm not saying he's Eli or Tarkenton or any of these guys. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that, but – what do you guys feel about his um, his career with us? I know it didn't work out when he was in Carolina, but I think when he came to us, he was a hell of a hell of a quarterback. Um, um, I'll take it off the air, but I just wanted to see what you guys you know thought about those two comments about the draft and, sure. and uh, Collins. And thank you guys for taking my call. Thank you, Jason. I'll knock out your first one first. Uh, the Giants have not confirmed, and they will not comment on who's here for workouts and who's not. So Jeff and I can't do that either. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff we don't know can who give, they are anyway. Jeff can give a generic as to importance of players being here for this stage of oh. off-season program. No, I, especially with a new coach. I think it's it's pretty crucial that you are here. Um, there's no reason for you not to be here, you know, in my in my opinion. I agree with you. Um, you know, but there are certain things, you, you know. But it is voluntary. We should It is voluntary. That. And a lot of times, you know, the way the teams get around this, um, the voluntary thing, is that there's bonuses. You know, you got to make so percentage of your workout to get a bonus. So Did you ever work out bonus <clears> in your contract? I didn't because they didn't need to. Did give you have me a one. rounds of golf bonus in your contract? <laughs> yeah, that was more important. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we'd like to give you a workout, but no, I want a golf bonus. That's good because I'm playing golf after I'm done working out. Uh, but or lot of, before you go work or out. Or before I work out. Yeah. Or before practice sometimes. Says Mike Holmgren. Uh, yeah. But I think it's important for these guys that, that are here. Uh, it just shows that they care, they want to be here. And with a new staff, I think you want to bring in that first impression. Because a lot of times uh, it doesn't sit well with coaches if they're going over the roster and the strength coach is checking off names and handing it to the coach at the end of the day and your name is consistently not there. Whether or not, I can tell you this, if you're an established veteran like myself back in the day, 
they didn't have to worry about me. They knew that I was doing what I was doing. But, you know, for the most part, this is not a veteran team. A lot of these, this is a young team. So they got to be here. They really do. Agree. Um, as for Aquanu, the reason I have Neil ahead of him now, for sure, and I, I kind of always did, and I'm still back and forth in Aquanu. I'll give you Cross. why I think he's ahead of him. Well, I, Neil's played right tackle before. We've mm-hmm. seen him play right tackle. And look, I think it, it, is it possible that Neil fails at tackle and you have to move him to guard? Yeah, I think it's possible, but I think well, he'd we'll be take fine the at it. Yeah. But I think he does have that flexibility to do it, and I, I think he played better at right tackle than he did at left tackle. So that's why I feel really good about Neil being my number one guy. I, I never feel bad about liking a player that comes from that program. Right. <laughs> I mean, they are coached well. They are disciplined. You know what I'm saying? Look at McKinney. Look at the guys. That, it's just they're, they're, they're just really good football players. And you hear Neil talk, and then you look at his body structure, and I'm just like, can I really picture that guy failing? No, I just I just picture him getting so much better. I know. I agree. You know? Mm-hmm. And he's just a large man. I mean, come on. Nah, like he, he is a freak show. The way he carries is 335. Pounds. And I know you'll agree with me. If I ask you this question, would you rather sure up the right guard or the right tackle position? Oh, right tackle. Okay, tackle. then there you go. So and Aquanu's and Quanu's played left guard. He's played left tackle. He hasn't played right tackle. And Charles Cross has never played right side either. So yeah. then how, how does it affect those guys changing your footwork, going to the other side of the line? Well, I, it maybe maybe it doesn't affect them at all, but maybe it does. Well, there is a learning curve to it. How short or how long is it? Right. I mean, I, I don't have time to wait here. So, in in your opinion, give me a guy that's played it, that has to not so much relearn it. He's done that. See, now it's funny. This is kind of like my inner debate, right? Because eventually, I'm gonna have to come on the show and say, "All right, if Aquano and Cross are both there, who are you taking?" Right now, I don't know yet. I think I know, but I'm not there. And here's my conundrum. If I knew I was drafting a left tackle, I would pick Charles Cross and feel good about it. Here's the problem. not picking a left tackle. Yeah, no, I'm you're just going to say we're not. Right. We've got to pick a right tackle. Because <laughs> we're not. you're not moving Thomas to right tackle. And if Cross fails at right tackle, I don't think he's a guard. So then you have a lost player. But I think he's a better chance of succeeding at tackle than Aquanu because I think his pass protection better. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But and I think Jason was right about this with his point. I think Aquanu, if you move him in the guard, is going to be fantastic. Mm-hmm. Like he's strong, he's powerful, a mall people. I feel good that he will be at worst a very good guard if he fails at tackle. But I don't love Aquanu's pass protection. Again, he's switching sides of the line. Cross's pass protection is, is outstanding. So that's kind of what my balancing act is. One's a little bit safer because I feel like, all right, I'll move Aquanu yeah. to guard. We'll be fine. But Cross, I think, I feel better about his pass protection. So, so it's where hard. You, what you, you're protecting your downside risk. Correct. That's, and that's important, especially picking at that level. I am hedging my bet with, yeah. with Aquanu. I want to make sure yeah. I get a player that's going to help my football team. Sure. And, yeah. I'm sh- and again, talking to Aquanu, and hearing him and how smart he is and just what he looks like, mm-hmm. I have trouble seeing that guy failing. Okay. So there's your there's your answer. Yeah, but I can get a great pass protecting right tackle if I pick Charles Cross. <laughs> but again, and that's why so it's but hard. you don't see Charles Cross as a guard. I don't, not at all. That's so there's 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 your answer. See, you're pro- like I said, you have to protect if he doesn't do good at right tackle, I'm gonna put him at guard. All right. Do you have your two guys? Who's going to be yeah, better? I know. I know. I know. Uh, Terry Collins, give me your take on that from Jason Sterling. Well, first of all, I was just, I was a teammate of him. That's remember why in I 03? Yep. Uh, now that year didn't go so well. Amazing teammate. <laughs> that year didn't yeah, go so no, well. No, did not go so well. <laughs> uh, tough as nails. Um, quarterback. Tough, tough dude. Um, great teammate. Great locker room guy. Oh. I think he was very underappreciated in, in, in both places that he went oh. and played. Um, but you know, I think that he probably threw one of the best spirals that you've ever seen. Oh, he threw a much nicer ball than Eli. Oh my Not God. Not even close. You know who else threw? Cause I used to catch for the, for the quarterbacks in practice. Did you, you really? Know? Yeah. You know, it's just, we're, we're always, we're all always done when practice starts of our warm ups and stuff. So it's just, you know, and, but Kerry Collins forceful throw, man. I mean, just ripping your hands apart. You know who the other guy is that threw the ball the most beautiful spot I've ever seen is Warren Moon. You know Holy what? I'm not smokes. surprised by that. And you know what? It looked 
catchable. Oh my! Just was it soft? Oh so, yeah, but it was just. I mean, a little force. You know, you got to have a little force, but just, just so nice. But but it, but it didn't feel like a brick hitting your hand. No when no it no, got to you. no no no. Watch, that, and you know what? Growing up watching him play for the Oils in the nineties, yeah, you see it, that spiral. It looked yeah. like John Fasendo the balls in ball. the air. The, the thing is throwing through. Oh throwing to like Ernest Givens and now, with Jeffries and all those Eli, guys. Oh, it was Eli, great. completely different story. Eli did not <laughs> throw the greatest spiral there ever was, and we've seen him. You know, but they got there. I'm gonna get him down here. I think he's up. Oh, uh, is he up there? Good. I, don't I hope know. he's he listening. Be, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so it's uh, which by the way, it's Masters week, and every time I, every time this week comes along, by the way, it's the best week, and you know, it's just for us golfers. Um, so how's Tiger doing, Pearson? Is, 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 we get a Tiger is, is, update? What, what, what Min- minus one right now. Ooh, Ooh okay. Right, we like it. Tied for second. By the way, through how many holes? And eight. Ooh, all right. Nice job, Tiger. Good job. If you just, if you read. If, I know you're not a golfer, but but no, just, I used to golf. I just I don't but anymore. This this is a huge story that he's the here. I, I didn't even think it was fathomable he would try. Nobody and play. did right. But listening to him all week talk about everybody drilled him with. Do you think you can do it? Do you think you can do it? We're talking about the greatest golfer that ever walked this earth. Right. If he doesn't think that he can win, he he's not going to be there. The biggest thing for him is just the, is the recovery. Dude, even if he just makes the cut, I'd be impressed. You want him to make the cut because the Masters with Tiger is way m- oh, it's it's so good. So Yeah, he um, says the walking is the hardest part. It's got <laughs> and that course is not easy to you know, walk. I wonder, Jeff, and I'd like to get you, and, and we will get to your, by the way, we can't go and eat lunch till one thirty. so if you go late, I guess it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> um, yeah, all so the players I, are I, in the building I, now. I, I, I have three people on the line. I will get to all you, I promise. And Charlie, we'll get to you, Doug and Mike. I promise we'll get to all three. We, we will. I wonder with Tiger, you know, he's a guy that's always been trying to play with the swing, right? Always trying to tweak it to make it perfect. I wonder if the injuries now, because he's had so many, knee, back, and yeah. now the leg, if it's almost limited his swing options to the point where he, he, can't he only it. has to do it a certain way. Yeah, 100%. And it kind of simplifies things for him a little bit, yeah. you know? Well, you just, you first of all, if, if you're a golfer, You'll understand this. If you're not playing, if you're not hitting the ball well, you got no chance. So the first thing, regardless if it's it's very difficult to walk the course and recover, if his game wasn't ready, he has he would have no shot at that golf course. And, and he would not show up and embarrass himself either. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So his game is there, which leads him to believe that he can win it, which now he's just going to have to struggle through the recovery of walking that golf course. Yeah. Guys, it's when you, I've been lucky enough to be there Watch the Masters and play the course. You played the course. I played the course. Ooh. That's why I said when, every time I, Eli brought me to Augusta. That's right, that's, right, that's right. So, anyways, that course on TV is so much different in person as far as the undulation. You can see it on TV, but it is way worse on in, when you're there. A lot of hills. It is so hilly. I mean, it's a hard course to walk. That's why Tiger is concerned about you know his recovery. But it's just going to be fun. Uh, watching him And there's play. a lot of waiting between shots. Well, here's a question, and this is a really dumb question, maybe. Well, it's just Sergio Garcia's in front of you, yeah. Some of these guys <laughs> take forever to hit the ball. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like Diker Park in Brooklyn on, on a Saturday, 8 o'clock in the morning. I've actually played when, that course. It's a five-hour round. It's brutal. Well, oh, my God. Any municipal ends. golf course. Yes. In, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Here's a stupid, maybe this is a stupid question. Because, you know, you have to wait on the tee boxes sometimes for 10, right. 15 minutes in these events. Is there a bench? So he could sit down on a bench yeah, while he's waiting to tee There's off. benches there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure in like in the professionals if they had benches yeah, or not. Yeah, they have benches. There are there. benches. Sit there. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. All right. Let's go to Charlie in Portland, Maine. Hi, Charlie. Speaking of benches, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> Your guys. bench, Charlie. What's up, Charlie? <laughs> hey, I got a couple things. <clears throat> you always uh, do. One thing, <laughs> one thing is, um, wasn't 2018 supposed to be like a great quarterback class? What happened? Which year it was 2018 so again? Was was that the uh, Baker Mayfield, Mayfield class? Mayfield, Rosen. Uh, that was Haskins. And, well, no. In, 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 in fairness, no, no, it wasn't Haskins. In, no, fairness it wasn't Haskins. in fairness, Charlie, you do have two of the top six or seven quarterbacks in the entire league were drafted that year, in Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson. Yeah, well, Lamar Jackson's still a question mark. Uh, Allen probably isn't. Lamar Jackson me, was the Jackson, MVP. Yeah, dude, Lamar Jackson won the NFL MVP. <laughs> what are you, yeah, what are you still did, questioning? But he's a running back. That's what he is. He's, he's more. No, no, he's, 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 yeah. he's, not, he's not a running back. He's a quarterback that is an excellent runner. 
Yeah, well, he. All I'm saying, it was five or six that were supposed to be great in that class, and yeah, they but, weren't. No, you know you're never going to get five or six that are right. always going to be great. And by, and, by, and, and, and by the way, Baker Mayfield's not yeah. a bad quarterback. He's just Baker not a good Mayfield quarterback. is an average NFL yeah. quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, this quarterback class, everyone's saying it's not that good. It might end up being good. So that's all I'm trying to say is that no, just because that people say it's supposed argument. to be a good class. All right, though, Charlie, oh, Charlie, let's play this way. Go back and tell me a quarterback class that was supposed to be bad but ended up being good. Um, I'd have to go back and see. Well, that's, <laughs> your, that, that, that's your homework assignment over the weekend. Right. When you call All back right. next well, week, I'm I want you to you. find me a quarterback class okay. that was supposed okay. to be poor and nobody got picked high and ended up being a good class. Okay. My guess is you're going to be looking this, for a long time. <laughs> well, I think this year is going to be one of, one of those. Oh, that's all I'm going to say about Why? that. And the other, okay, and the other thing I wanted to say is that we're probably going to end up moving the number five pick. And the reason I'm saying that is Seattle is going to want to jump the Panthers at six because mm-hmm. the Panthers are going to go after a quarterback. They're mm-hmm. going to go after Willis. And I think Seattle wants Willis. And I think that's where we're going to do, do the trade. Yeah, that's possible. We're going to we're going to end up with nine. They're going to end up with five. And I guess we probably could get a two and a, and a three one. or something. And a one. Uh, and, and no, I, you I can't. You got to get a one. Moving four spots. Not for four spaces. No, You're not you getting one get moving four spots. No. I don't think, Jeff. No. I think no. a two, maybe a two and a four. It just depends on how many ones they have. Yeah, they don't have it. In there. I don't think they you get a one for that. Actually, Trust me, Jeff, no one wants to get a one next year more than I do. <laughs> I just tried to get it. <laughs> I don't think that's happening, bro. I right, forget the Seahawks. Who else? <laughs> Who I else wants to get up there that I has know, like, Old Jokes aside, yeah. if you want to get a one, I think you're talking sometime after the 15th pick. Okay, moving all the way up that high. Yeah. Okay, all right. Is that something last year, right? The Giants were picking 10. They moved all the way down to what were they picking? Ten last year, the Giants. It's eleven, eleven, whatever it is. Oh, it looks like we lost Charlie. Too bad. Eleven. Um, and we moved 11. all the way down to twenty. So that's about nine spots. I think you got to probably move around at least ten spots, around ten spots, if you want to get a one. Okay, so it's not enough. I'm just trying. Un- un- unless you're like pick it first or second, in which case then yeah. you get more for like that super premium pick. I do seem to think that Seattle is going to do that though. Or you know, do they come up and maybe yeah, yeah. Um, no, look, I think I think the fifth, I think the fifth pick is more valuable than the seventh pick because of the Panthers at six. I well, agree with you. And if that now. does happen, I'm okay because then you got seven and nine, right? I mean, so oh yeah, dude, you can still get still getting. I mean, you might get Kyle Hamilton at nine. Yeah, well, according you know with that Schrager one, you that's get, Kyle Hamilton you might was get going Kayvon to the Thibodeau Washington. at nine. I mean, maybe, maybe, but you get Jermaine Johnson, maybe. Uh, I got no problem with him. Now the question is, do you want? And look, Paul, I, I will not say this when he's on the show because I don't want to make him think that I'm agreeing with him. Because there's tons of stuff that you can throw at you. I, I am I am concerned about not getting an offensive tackle at five or seven. That is a large concern for me. So if I'm not getting that one next year, right. is it worth me sacrificing? Now, if I, if I know I can still get an OT at seven, then all right, see ya. I'm good. Later. I but think it, you will. But if, if, if I think... Like if two are gone, like if you get to five and two are gone already, and, and someone's looking still. to trade, and you don't know what Carolina's doing at six, I would be I would be little nervous about that. A little bit, I'd probably still do it, but I'd be a little nervous. <laughs> I'd be a little nervous. I, I would have to call my call my people and see if I could figure out what Carolina is doing at six. You mean call your doctor and see how mentally you are? If it's you got to take the Giants have got to come out of the. They have to come out there with with an offensive lineman. They have to. I feel like I. The more I look at the guys, they I don't. To. I don't feel really good about the second round tackle options. I just don't. No, I, a second round guard option. I'm okay. Oh with. yeah, sure. Or a second round center option. Sure. But not not the tackle. And I'll tell you what, though, I'm not sure what the. Va- I almost feel like <laughs> top of the third round might be a better spot for a guard. Unless Zion or Kenyon Green and Tyler Lindebaum get to you. Well, Zion, Lindebaum I seems to be think plummeting. Be there at that second. Dude, I don't think Zion. Zion Johnson have probably visited the Cap, was visiting the Cowboys this week. They lost Connor Williams. You don't think they want to plug him right in a guard? He seems next like to a Tyron. Cowboy. Imagine him next to Tyron Smith. He seems like a Cowboy. I hope not. <laughs> Knowing our luck, though. The Cowboys actually do a good job of just picking the best guy. 
Well, and, at- and they've gotten lucky. Like, CeeDee Lamb fell right in their laps. Well. And, and that's the funny thing. Like, people talk about the Cowboys draft all, and they do. But here, here's the story nobody talks about. They tried to draft three quarterbacks before they drafted Dak Prescott. They liked, um, oh, God, Paxton Lynch out of Memphis. They tried to trade up for him. Oh, he last He played, like, one game in the league. What a disaster. <laughs> yeah. They wanted to draft Connor Cook from Michigan State over Dak oh, Prescott in the same round. Yeah. So sometimes you just get lucky. Like so, last year, they wanted to draft Patrick Sertan or J.C. Horn. Yeah, and they get C.D. Lamb. No, they got Michael Parsons. Oh, Michael Parsons, right. that's right. So yeah. Michael Parsons. No, the year in, before. He wasn't even their first pick. It was like the third choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's, just, it's just funny. And, you know, and Stephen Jones had to beat up Jerry so that they drafted Zach Martin instead of um, the other Browns quarterback, uh, Johnny Manziel. Oh, my God. <laughs> they got lucky. Like, that's what I'm They've saying. Lucky. Like, they eventually make the right decision, yeah. but... There's some, there's some luck involved yeah. there, too. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And they and they definitely go by best available. And by the way, nothing would have been wrong with drafting Sertan or no. J.C. Horn. They're really good players. Yeah, Sertan especially. But, He's really good. And, you know, they also drafted Ezekiel Elliott over Jalen Ramsey. That probably wasn't the right decision either. Well, one thing with, anyway. with uh, you know, I can say this positively is that we're going to be able to do this in three weeks. We're going to have to. We will know the answers to all, all right. of this racking our brains. Let's go to Mike in Brooklyn. He's up next. Mike. Mike. Hey, guys. I can't wait for draft day. My <laughs> head is spinning for like the last two months. Good Lord. Yeah, Je- Je- Jeff and I get to sit here for two hours a day and not run out of things to talk no, about. No, absolutely. We could we could no. go over every scenario. We could be your own draft, uh, uh, what you call it, the, the what's the thing on PFF? Um, uh, mock draft mock simulator. Mock draft simulator. Yes. Yeah. Oh, when I see the mock drafts and then I see, you know, mock drafts, 4,000, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we're embarking um, on that number soon because they're, yeah. they're about to that hey, right we now. we got three weeks to go, baby. Yeah. I want to talk about, uh, let's get away from the draft a little bit. The other day uh, they showed the um, Week 15 um, Colts um, a Patriots game from last year. Okay. And my eyes were glued on Glowinski because I wanted to see what we were getting. Mm-hmm. What a, what an improvement over Hernandez. Yes, uh, yes, that is correct. Oh, I mean this this man. I mean he 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 was pushing people around. He was a he, him him. Ryan Kelly didn't play that game because I think his daughter had passed away the week before. Hmm. But Quentin Nelson, he's a. I didn't know Quentin Nelson was three hundred thirty pounds. Oh no, he's a monster. Yeah. <laughs> and that middle, that you know, the speech with like Ryan Kelly was playing. And Glowinski and and uh, Quentin Nelson. I mean, uh, what, what, and and Taylor. That's where he went. I oh, mean, yeah. Why wouldn't you? Taylor ran. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't you? Right. Yeah. yeah, Mike. And the thing about it too, Mike. What I liked about Glowinski. And look, I think Will Hernandez. Once he got his hands on people, he was fine. Sure. He just had so many issues figuring out stunts and twists and stuff yeah. like that in pass pro. And Glowinski's a very smart, aware player. Mm-hmm. He's not going to struggle yeah. with that. He stuff. has that sixth I, sense. I noticed that. I noticed that. He, no, no, any st- any anything that they threw at him, he handled. Um, and now Arizona, uh, yeah. uh, Hernandez is Arizona's problem for now. I, I liked. I, I actually liked Will the first couple of years, but then his play just got to a point where, you know, you, you got you got to like the guy. Yeah, he's a nice guy, but he's not not playing up oh, to yeah. potential. Oh, that's true. It's funny, Mike. It's actually it's like the Cardinals and the Giants traded players, right? The Cardinals let go right. of Matt Garcia. The Giants right. let go of Will Hernandez, yeah. and they both basically signed identical contracts to each other. Yeah, It's funny. We'll, we'll yeah. Hopefully we get the best of the two. So I think both teams think they're upgrading. We'll see which, <laughs> we'll see which one is right. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get an Arizona Cardinal person on here to talk about that, right? I don't know if we well, should, I- actually. <laughs> I think we're going to have the best uh, in in line, you know, between guard from guard to guard competition that we've had in many years. That's what you want, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, want. I think left guard is going to be a hell of a fight. Mm-hmm. Now, hopefully, you I draft mean, somebody me, that can win it, but it's, right now it's a hell of a fight. Yeah, I like I, I, I like Lemieux. I just like the like the kid. I like his makeup. I hope I hope he comes back and and comes back well, even if he doesn't start. I just want him to be a rotational player if he can. Well, I did tell you what, Mike. I was talking to Lemieux in the last year. He thought he would try to get back at the end of the season last year. and He thought he had a a shot at it then. So don't worry about his health. His health's going to be fine. Yeah, Yeah, because you remember when he he stepped in for Hernandez, they just just had – it seemed like they had uh, more – 
a toughness, a more more toughness, and and they didn't get pushed around as much because it was Gates and it was him, and they didn't let no nobody uh, touch Danny Dimes or any of their players. They were they were going over to the sidelines and smacking people around, <laughs> and that's what I that's what I like in a lineman. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate the call. And look, I think. You know, Gates and Lemieux were those, like, old school, not the most athletic, Richie Soybert, blue yeah. collar, yeah. nasty, Duke sc- scratching claw your way to get things done. Well, I think Lemieux does, does have some work to do in pass pro. He does. He's got, actually, I think he has a lot to do in both areas, run and pass. But, you know, he's a young guy. He's a he has a fifth-round draft pick for a reason. He has the personality for it. And, you yeah. Know. Well, I look at... Uh, uh, yeah, I just think there's going to be, I, I agree, there's going to be a great competition. And by the way, that's that's what's going to, how it's going to, you're going to fill this offensive line through that competition. Well, when you don't have a lot of money to spend. Yeah, you're going to compete, yeah. You look at all the linemen that the Giants brought in. You just throw numbers at the problem. You hope somebody's good. <laughs> I know. It's like throwing mud against the wall. Like something's got to stick, right? I mean, sooner or later it's going to happen. But I, I think that, uh, you well, That's know, why I think a center and a guard are very possible 100%. mid-round draft picks here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yep. nobody nobody right now at center and left guard. You know, Glinsky signed a three-year, I think, three-year contract, whatever it was. Three I years. Think. Yeah. Um, like, he's a relative long-term answer. Andrew Thomas is obviously a long-term answer. Mm-hmm. But at, you know, Feliciano, it's a short-term, short-term sure. deal, yeah. right? And you hope it works, and you hear a long time, but you don't well, know right now. And once again, John. So left know, guard, center, right tackle is still a figure it out. And as you as you improve your cap situation going into 2023 – you might have the you might have an you know more money to go out and maybe sign you a, a quality yeah. free agent lineman. And next year is going to be better. Mm-hmm. The next year is after that is going to be the yeah. year. That's the year that's that we the all year should where be all excited. the dead money is gone. And every right? and by the way, that's also the third year in Dable's program. That would be the third year in Dable's. And that's program. when you're going to see. I think this is when yes. things to, start to. To me, this be. is a you know reset it year. Figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Next year, you want to you know see that subtle improvement. You know, if Daniel Jones takes a big step forward, maybe maybe it's more than a subtle improvement. But if he doesn't take a big step forward, and you have a new rookie quarterback in here, that's not going to be a big step forward either. Mm-hmm. You don't You're rookie quarterbacks generally don't win. Yeah, it, that's not how it, you know. Not everyone's Joe Burrow, right? Right, right, right. And even he didn't win as a rookie in Cincinnati. No, he so, didn't. He got killed. Exactly. So <laughs> that's that twenty twenty. God, I, Giant fans going to kill me. That twenty twenty four year to me is that is the target year. You said it. <laughs> But you're not disagreeing with me. Let's go to Doug in you New York. It. No, I'm he, not. He will wrap us up today. No. Doug, what's going on? Uh, you were talking about Zion Johnson now. Has he played both tackle and guard, or is he just strictly just a guard? He did start one year at left tackle, but watching him he's on tape, he, he he looks like a guard to me. He's, he'd be, he's, big, he's a big quality guard, right? He is... He is one of the safer players, and he might not be like an All Pro. No, but he's also been moving up the boards. People are, you know, I don't think he was sought after a little while ago. Now I think people really are getting an idea of what this guy can do. Yeah, Doug. For me, I don't. There, there's no red flag for me with Zion. He just doesn't look dominant on tape. He just just like he's a really, really good football player. Consistent, consistent as it gets. Yeah, he's just a blue collar worker that gets the job done. Right? Yeah, and he's yeah. smart. His body mm-hmm. is perfect. Mm-hmm. He's serious. He might even be able to play center for you, too. Like, he took centers in Mobile yeah. at the Senior Bowl. So, okay. yeah, absolutely. So, But but he probably won't, with, with him rising, he probably won't last the second round. We'd, we'd probably have to well, we'd Paul, trade it down. We'd probably have to grab him in the first round. Yeah, right? the, the Tino was on two days ago trying to convince me Zion's going to be there in round two, and I just laughed at him. But, you know, Paul, he always he always plans for guys to be there. That he knows aren't going to be there, just so he can get disappointed by it. <laughs> that's what he does guys, every year. Should, he picks out a guy that's supposed to go ten and, picks earlier. You should get, try and get Paul to try and pick people that go all the gut teams draft him because it seems like all the good people that Paul picks, they either trade up ahead of us and draft a, like one or two, one or two. Yeah, he should he just keep his mouth on, shut then. Then that won't jinx him. on Taylor Lewin. When he was coming out of Michigan, and then yeah. Jack Conklin when he came up, yep. and the, both those times when they came up on the draft, someone traded up get ahead of us to grab those guys. <laughs> yeah, and he, his big mouth must have got around the whole <laughs> NFL and said, "Oh, we got to draft these guys." Paul knows something. We know we better draft these guys. I think you're getting, those guys I were think, taking just a just a, 
I, think, I, I think you gave a Paul a little bit too much credit because <laughs> it, it was it, it was it was more than just him. But Paul does have a bad. Uh, and he, I always, this is, I'm not going behind his back. No. I, I say this to his face all the time. He has, he has a very, you know, bad tendency of targeting guys and getting attached to guys. And that then deep get, down yeah, yeah. in his soul, he knows he's not going to get. I'm not yeah. sure why he decides right. to punish himself like that, but he does. It was like right. me with uh, with Kyle Pitts last year. I knew what Jones yes. were going to get. No, him. but you oh, weren't like attached to him. Like you're not no. going to fall off a chair. No, 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 no. Like no. when he's not there. Yeah. No. No, I'm not going to fall. Well, off I chair. remember like the year before that. He had the thing with Claypool, the, the kid, the big yeah, kid. Yeah, Chase Claypool. Yeah, he wanted him he in round three. Dame. It's like, no, Paul. He's not going to be there he in round three. Out when, when, when he got drafted, I heard him. He was freaking out in the, in the after draft show about, oh, they stole my – you know, you don't brag about this guy so much. And maybe they wouldn't steal. But but he he gets he gets too intense about when, when guys get taken when the Giants don't get him. <laughs> well, Doug, you got anything else for us or are you good? Well, I was going to ask you about tight ends, but no, but I heard fine. earlier, but I didn't. I didn't hear anything about mm. tight ends from LSU. I heard that they sounded like they got like a running back that maybe we could get in the later mid later rounds. It would be a pretty good backup or change of pace guy. That he's like two hundred twenty five pounds. Yeah, and, and Doug, appreciate the call. Like, I think the Giants picking a running back here, Jeff. And I, I have I, have, I have not watched the LSU running back. I'm going to go back and, and give him a. Give him a quick look today after the the guy said so many nice things about him. I did not watch him uh, before because he's kind of projected as kind of like almost like a seventh round type mm-hmm. of pick. Um, that I, I don't usually go that deep because I have to you know manage my time. <laughs> but I would feel pretty strongly that the Giants are going to walk away with a running back here, either round three or later. Is how I'll phrase it. What about uh, maybe second, third round pick or later? I don't know if they're going to pick a running back top of third round, but maybe that second pick in the third round. Uh, remember uh, Brees Hall, the running back oh, from Iowa he's, State? He's really good, man. So there's a guy that you can look at, may may get to the third round. No, he's not. No? No, no here's my bald, bald Dino analysis. Yes. <laughs> I, oh, no, I he could get in the third <clears throat> round. The two guys that I feel very strongly, and these are the only two at running back, that I feel very strongly will not be there in the third round okay. are Hall mm-hmm. and Walker from Michigan State. Who no, I that actually was the other like one a, I was looking for. Yeah. That's the guy I like a little bit more than okay. Hall. Unfortunately, Jeff, I think if you want one of those two guys, I think you got to use your second round on him. Which they're not going to do. No, I, and by the way, I don't think they should. Um, I don't think they should. But those guys, I think, are going to be both really good starting running backs in the NFL. Yeah, good for them. Yeah. Like if I'm... Oh, uh, boy. Let me look at the draft order here. Uh, right here. Do you got to draft that? Yep. Uh, I don't know if that one's updated. After yeah, the... it's close enough. If <laughs> I'm... Uh, I'm looking at the top of the second round. The Jets drafted Michael Carter last year. Mm-hmm. Like Chicago. If I'm yeah. Chicago and I'm trying to give Justin Fields a running back and you want to pick one at the top of the second round there, David Montgomery? No, nah, he's still with that, right? I think he's on yeah, his last year there. there. Denver? No, they drafted somebody last year. Oh, Seattle? Pete Carroll loves him with some running backs. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that a pick. You know, Atlanta? They're in desperate need Unle- of a running unless, back. Unless Seattle's cor- trading that pick. Yeah, maybe. Cordero Patterson? I know he's kind of a part-timer if you want to pair someone with him. But I don't think they're in a position where they're rebuilding where they need a running he back. He just got a new contract. You know what? There's not actually not a lot of really good landing points. Maybe the Chargers in the second round. Maybe. Uh, Eckler's a good player, but he's not a full-time guy. Who this? Uh, no, you know what? Miami in the second round, maybe. They don't have a. You know, they just brought two guys in though, right? They brought in Edmonds and. What picks uh, are the Giants in the second? They only have one pick. Thirty-six. Thirty-six. A little early for them. <clears throat> no, no, that's way too early. Philly, if you don't believe in Miles Sanders, could they pick a running back in round two? Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. I could see that. Miles Sanders is, is not – New you know, England? He's hurt a lot. New England in round two? I know they got a bunch of guys, but it's just the guys. Who knows what New England does. Whatever <laughs> they do, they do it right. Buffalo could pick a running back in round two. Single, it's, uh, Singleton and they have uh, Zach Moss still. I mean, I, you know what? You put, a, you put a really good running back with that offense – did they sign a running back in free agency this year, though? 
I thought they did. Did they? They might have. I don't. I remember. think they did. Um, you know what? I don't. I don't see a lot of obvious landing spots unless I'm missing a team here that I'm looking at. I mean, Atlanta needs one. I just don't think you know they're rebuilding. You don't pick a running back when you're rebuilding generally. At least I wouldn't. A conversation we've had here. Um, yeah, I mean Houston, I guess. Houston could pick a running back. Again, they're rebuilding, but they don't have anyone. I can see them picking a running back at the top of the second round. Um, the Bills did not. Sign. Yeah, so oh, maybe, yeah, Duke Johnson. Yeah, he's more of a third down yeah, guy. He's a one one <clears> year <throat> guy. That I knew that I had. A, I I remember them hearing that they had signed somebody like that. So all right, we should go. Taiwan Jones is another one. That I'm they killing signed. Pearson over here. He's watching Tiger Woods. He's fine. <laughs> I mean, he's not watching. He's working hard. I'm working not watching Tiger hard. Woods. Now Jeff is watching. Tiger <laughs> <Woods>. <laughs> it's now time to go, John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for being with us, everybody. Tomorrow, you, we'll, tomorrow we will do Alabama prospects. Jeff Lance and I will be with you, uh, and we'll try to get. I want the, the reason we went long today, folks. I know we haven't taken a ton of your calls over the past month or so. I wanted to make sure we got your calls in. So, uh, and we'll make sure we get your calls in tomorrow after the uh, Alabama guest off the top. For Jeff Eagles, I'm John Schmelk. We'll see you on Friday for our final edition of the week of Big Blue Kickoff Live.